Welcome to worship with the people of our saviors. It is a joy to celebrate Christ present with us, however and wherever we are gathered. In Deuteronomy, God promises to raise up a prophet like Moses, who will speak for God. In Psalm 111, God shows the people the power of God's work. For the church, these are the ways of pointing to the unique authority people sensed in Jesus' actions and words. We encounter that authority in God's word around which we gather. The word that prevails over any lesser spirit that would claim power over us, freeing us to follow Jesus. As we begin our confession, I invite you to mark the sign of the cross, the mark that was placed on your forehead in baptism, a sign and a promise of God's unending love for you. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose voice is upon the waters, whose mercy is poured out on all people, whose goodness cascades over all creation. Let us confess our sin, trusting the abundant mercy of God's grace. You search us and know us. You are acquainted with all our ways. We confess that our hearts are burdened by sin, our own sins and the broken systems that bind us. We turn inward, failing to follow your outward way of love. We distrust those who are not like us. We exploit the earth and its resources and fail to consider generations to come. Forgive us, gracious God, for all we have done and left undone. Even before the words on our tongues, you know them. Receive them in your divine mercy. Amen. How vast is God's grace. Through the power and promise of Jesus Christ, our sins are washed away, and we are claimed as God's own beloved. Indeed, we are forgiven. In the wake of God's forgiveness, we are called to be the beloved community, living out Christ's justice and the Spirit's reconciling peace. Amen. Let us pray. Compassionate God, you gather the whole universe into your radiant presence and continually reveal your Son as our Savior. Bring wholeness to all that is broken and speak truth to us in our confusion, that all creation will see and know your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our first reading is from Deuteronomy 18, verses 15 through 20. Today's reading is part of a longer discourse in Deuteronomy, an updating of the law for the Israelite community as the people wait to enter the promised land. Here Moses assures the people that God will continue to guide them through prophets who will proclaim the divine word. A reading from Deuteronomy. Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me, from among your own people, you shall heed such a prophet. This is what you requested of the Lord your God at Horeb, on the day of the assembly when you said, If I hear the voice of the Lord my God any more, or ever again see this great fire, 
I will die. Then the Lord replied to me, they are right in what they have said. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their own people. I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet who shall speak to them everything that I command. Anyone who does not heed the words that the prophet shall speak in my name, I myself will hold accountable. But any prophet who speaks in the name of other gods or, or who presumes to speak in my name, a word that I have not commanded the prophet to speak, that prophet shall die. Word of God, word of life, thanks be to God. A reading of Psalm 111. Hallelujah! I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright in the congregation. Great are your works, O Lord, pondered by all who delight in them. Majesty and splendor mark your deeds, and your righteousness endures forever. You cause your wonders to be remembered. You are gracious and full of compassion. You give food to those who fear you, remembering forever your covenant. You have shown your people the power of your works in giving them the lands of the nations. The works of your hands are faithfulness and justice. All of your precepts are sure. They stand fast forever and ever because they are done in truth and equity. You sent redemption to your people and commanded your covenant forever. Holy and awesome is your name. The fear of the Lord is a beginning of wisdom. All who practice this have a good understanding. God's praise endures forever. Our second reading comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 8, 1 through 13. Paul is concerned about the way some Corinthian Christians use their freedom in Christ as a license to engage in non-Christian behavior that sets a damaging example to other impressionable believers. Christians have a responsibility to each other that their behavior does not cause another to sin. A reading from 1 Corinthians. Now concerning food sacrificed to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge, but anyone who loves God is known by him. Hence, as to the eating of food offered to idols. We know that no idol in the world really exists, and that there is no God but one. Indeed, even though there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as in fact there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist in one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. It is not everyone, however, who has this knowledge. Since some have become so accustomed to idols until now, they still think of the food they eat as food offered to an idol. And their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not bring us close to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if others see you, who possess knowledge, eating in the temple of an idol, might they not, since their conscience is weak, be encouraged to the point of eating food Sacrifice to idols? So by your knowledge, those weak believers for whom Christ died are destroyed. But when you thus sin against members of your family and wound their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food is a cause of your falling, I will never eat meat, 
so that I may not cause one of them to fall. Word of God, word of life, thanks be to God. Our Gospel reading comes from the Gospel of Mark, verses 21 to 28. Forces that would bring death and disease have taken hold of a man, yet they recognize Jesus and know what his power means for them. Jesus commands these forces to leave, and people are amazed at his authority. The Holy Gospel according to Mark, glory to you, O Lord. Jesus and his disciples went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught as... Jesus and his disciples went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then there was in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of Israel. I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this? A new teaching? And with authority, he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I brought us some Oreos today. Some Oreos, okay. Yeah, got some product placement. This sermon brought to you by Oreo. Yeah, maybe if you're good, you get one afterwards. Okay. So I brought my Oreos because, um, as you know, I'm practicing Veganuary. Yes, I know that. This January. So you've had the joy of having, at least me, prepare vegan-only mm -hmm. meals. I uh, got to try your oat milk and uh, coconut almond milk and um, tofu. It's probably on the docket for tonight. Yum. Isn't he lucky? <laughs> But why I brought up the Oreos is because I discovered that they're vegan. They are. Well, maybe. It kind of depends on who you're talking to. And if you browse the, the interwebs, as we say, um, you get a lot of different opinions. Because if you look at the lovely ingredient list, which I don't necessarily suggest you read if you want to enjoy your Oreo, but... If you look at them, none of those are animal byproducts or <clears throat> animal products. There's no meat in your Oreo. But some people argue that the machinery on which the Oreo is manufactured may also manufacture items with milk. And mm. so it may have come in contact with items Maybe that would continue. render it non-vegan. Mm. So the quandary is... Does some kind of peripheral contact or shared machinery make my Oreo no longer vegan and therefore unacceptable for me to eat? Have you come to a conclusion on this matter? Oh, I've eaten a few Oreos. Okay. <laughs> but this brings me to our first Corinthians text because it, I think it, it's a corollary to what's going on for the people in Corinth. So you have this new Christian community and they're trying to help people understand what it means to worship the one God in the midst of people who believe there's a whole lot of gods. And so the Christians are kind of like, well, these, these other gods out there that people say they're offering their meat to and or their animal to, mm -hmm. and then the meat gets sold so that people can have a hamburger for supper or something, um, they're, they're trying to decide, can I eat this? hamburger or not like does this meat is this meat been part of the sanctified process for this other god it belongs to this mm -hmm. other god and therefore as a follower of the one true god i cannot eat it in any way participate in that worship of this other god or do i say hey those other gods are just stone figures they don't mean anything so hey time for supper <laughs> and i think what 
what's interesting in Paul's conversation with the Corinthian church is not that he's saying, well, don't be stupid. Of course, there's no other gods like eat your meat. And he's not saying, oh, stay away because we don't want any part in that other worship. He's really mm -hmm. trying to help people understand, well, how do we make these decisions? And what he comes down to, I think, is, is love and love for neighbor. And he's saying, do whatever you need to do to help the person who's struggling the most, help the person mm. who's struggling in faith. Um, you know, don't make them have to question what's going on, help support them. And so, you know, if you're going to have your, your vegan friend over for dinner, maybe you don't pick the Oreos because then they might have to struggle with, well, can I eat it? Can I yeah. not? What's helpful? Um, you try to be as hospitable as possible to your guest and you try to be as hospitable as possible to your fellow Christian as you worship and gather together. Mm. Yeah, so I think the idea is to be helpful to the most fragile in your community. And I think that's something that can work for us in the church, too, to think about when we make decisions, um, you know, how are they helpful to the most fragile in our community? The one thing I see with this, though, is that it can really be flipped on its head mm. so that sometimes the loudest person or the dissenting voice can be the one who mutes the gospel. And so in the case of the Corinthians, it's about eating meat or not eating meat, dedicated to another God who does or doesn't exist. You know, and so the gospel point in that is what helps you to identify and worship the one true God and what helps you grow in love together. Yeah. But I think today, sometimes our churches can get to a point where they say, well, I'm not going to be a part of this church if you say something that I don't agree with, like Black Lives Matter or if you go to a march, or if you try to talk about climate change or anything that people, I think people use political as code word for things you're not allowed to talk about yeah. in church. And I think that is the way that today we're muting the gospel. We're mm. trying to silence the gospel to make church more comfortable. So I think, you know, take the Corinthians and think about, what is this trying to do? It's trying to help us worship our God and live together in community. And when someone brings up something they don't like in our preaching or our teaching, is that about helping everybody worship the one true God? And I think sometimes people would say, yes, it's keeping us in peace. And unity. church should be about unity and peace. But then you have to ask, who is the most vulnerable in that situation? And sometimes people would say, well, I am. I'm the one ready to leave if you don't do what I say. But the most vulnerable in that situation is the most vulnerable in our whole community, mm. right? It's the, the, the people who are Black whose lives become expendable when we say we're not going to say something like Black Lives Matter. It's the, the creation when we say, well, we can't talk about the implications of things like Line 3 or just mm -hmm. how we use energy or where we buy products. It's um, the people in our community who are struggling to to live when we say we can't talk about things like a minimum wage. And so I think it's really important for us to think about in our community, what are our goals and who are we serving? And we're trying to bring forward this one God who comes with love and mercy for all, who comes with healing and a vision for a new creation in which all things, not just all people, not just all white people, not just all Christians, but all things, creation and everything are brought into God's being and, and renewed. And so whatever we do in our preaching, our worship, our way of being church, are those things continuing to point to God and to the new creation that we await? So I think the Corinthians is really interesting when it, it talks about, you know, there are many gods and lords, you know, or maybe not, maybe they're all fake, but, but it, he does talk about there's going to be some powers in our world mm -hmm. and it's going to be up to us to decide, <clears throat> do we become affected by those powers? Are we swept up by these other gods? Just like Martin Luther will talk about your God is whatever you look to for, tr that you look to in trust. Mm -hmm. What do you look to for life? What are you depending on and what's forming your sense of of purpose and how you live your life. And so I think Corinthians is one place to start when we think about what is it that's shaping our life and our life in community as a church and how do we make those um, decisions of how to yeah. live together.
I think our gospel touches on that as well. Um, the gospel reading we just heard, we find uh, that no sooner has Jesus um, been baptized and he goes about proclaiming the kingdom of God um, and, and calls a few disciples to, to follow him, uh, does he face opposition uh, to the message that he proclaims? So we find Jesus today uh, in a synagogue where he's teaching and in the midst of the synagogue, um, a, a voice is raised and we learn that it's from uh, somebody who has an unclean spirit. And uh, so often I think we're kind of lulled by, by, the, by the reality that we think everybody would be in favor of what Jesus is saying and approve of it. Uh, but Mark's gospel especially, um, opposition comes pretty quickly. Mm. Um, and in, in this way, it's from, um, as you were talking about, the principalities and powers, the unseen forces that are at work um, in the lives of individuals in communities. And, and when I think about that, it, it brings me back to a couple of weeks ago when we were commemorating Martin Luther King Jr. Um, and he had a speech at the Riverside Church in New York City where he talks about these triple um, evils. And he names those evils as racism, materialism, and militarism. And, you know, what he means by those things are, you know, at work in our community life is racism, This the, the either overt or subconscious attitudes and prejudices with which I view other people, especially people of other races, but also the the policies and institutional structures that come from those attitudes and those prejudices. What he means by materialism is the fact that, you know, what it means to be a human being has been defined for us as like, it's about making money, it's about amassing wealth, um, and the destruction that that causes to human communities when it comes to poverty and to the earth, when it comes to the way we treat the environment in search of that goal. And then he also talks about violence, but not just any violence, militarism. And to, mm -hmm. so to me, that's not just the random violence a person might experience. It's sanctioned violence. It's the violence that we find acceptable, um, the violence that has permission to exist in our midst. Um, and so it makes me think of concepts like just war and law and order and capital punishment, these ways in which we dress um, violence up in officialness so that it's mm -hmm. acceptable. And so Martin Luther King Jr. names those three evils, racism, materialism, and militarism, as something that is behind our actions, that, are, that motivates and influences and moves us and our community. And that, to me, makes a lot of sense, especially with uh, an exorcism kind of story where we don't connect with it very well in our day and age because we don't live in such a demon haunted world or so we think but it, it's in many ways true to what the gospel writers thought about that people are caught up in these powers beyond their control that move them to do this and to do that um and and, and they possess a person so it makes me think if, if jesus were to walk into one of our churches today um maybe he'd have a similar teaching like Martin Luther King Jr. about these evils. Maybe he'd say something different. In any case, he's talking about the kingdom of God and what it's like and what it would do to us. It would rile us up just like this man with an unclean spirit. It would make us deeply uncomfortable because all the things that shape our life and move us this way and that uh, would be deeply offended by the things Jesus is, is, is telling us. And, it, you know, it touches well with this First Corinthians text, I think, because, um, yeah, there's, it's debatable whether there are many gods and many lords, but Paul comes back to that. Do it for the sake of these vulnerable people. Um, that That is the spirit that is meant to possess us, the spirit of empathy and compassion and welcome and justice, not these spirits that would say it's okay to do violence to people, it's okay to treat people like junk and is less worthy, um, that it's okay to do whatever it takes to amass wealth and privilege. Um, and so Jesus means to bring into our midst um, this good news of a kingdom that gifts us with an entirely different kind of spirit, not an unclean spirit, uh, but a spirit of life and love and power. So that, that brings me back to our baptism. And in a Lutheran church, in a baptism, we begin with an exorcism. 
Yeah. Right. We talk about um, we begin with three renunciations. You know, do you renounce the power of sin? Do you renounce the power of the devil? Do you renounce all these forces that defy God? And um, I think sometimes we gloss over that point. Yeah. But like that is us saying which of these spirits, which of these gods we're going to be aligned with. And we're saying we are not going to be aligned with the forces that that work death. And then we go through the baptism and we are washed with the water and we are united with Christ. We are marked with the sign of the cross and we are um, anointed and, and hands laid on us, told, you know, and prayed for the Holy Spirit to come upon us. Mm. And then, and then we renew that at confirmation where we pray for the Holy Spirit once again. And so it's that sense of as Christians, um, God is placing this new spirit, spirit within us. And um, that's why we have this whole list of promises in baptism yeah. that are meant to form us so that if Jesus were to arrive in our sanctuary, um, you know, we would be about the work of gathering together around the Lord's Supper, but we would also be about the work of proclaiming Christ in word and deed and about um, working for justice for all the world. Like our our formation as Christians um, is meant to bring us um, in line with God's priorities. And it's about celebrating that God has gifted us mm -hmm. with this new spirit, God's spirit. Part of those promises is to care for others and the world God made. Um, and what that that brings me to is um, when Jesus encounters this unclean this man with an unclean spirit, he doesn't just chuck the man out on the street. like um, th this man who is so riled up by what Jesus has to say is not to blame. He's caught up in forces that are beyond his control. Instead, Jesus silences the spirit um, and, you know, performs exorcism, tells him to, to vacate the premises. Um, and that makes me think in our day and age, one way that we care for um, each other and the world God made is to refrain from demonizing people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the power that we could be as Christians in the world is to understand in a new way that, yeah, there are evils that do possess us. And yeah, they look like racism. They look like acceptable violence. Uh, they look like a consumerism. Um, they look like individualism. They look like all these forces that move people um, and influence their lives. Um, and it helps us to see then our neighbors in a new light. Instead of they're my enemy, it's these forces that hold us in bondage, that they're caught up in. They are our enemy. Um, they are the ones that we are called uh, to silence when they don't speak the truth. They're the ones that we are called uh, to rid ourselves, um, rid our communities of. Not people, um, but these uh, these forces that kind of overtake us and of which we are also um, still battling. I mean, that's part of the baptismal promises as well as, um, you know, will you um, contend with these powers as part of the promises that we make? Um, that... Just because we're baptized doesn't mean that the struggle is over. It's a constant living into the fact that these other unseen powers, these systems and things in which we find ourselves are contending for us and our communal way of life, our gathering for worship, um, our sharing in the meal. All of this is trying to uh, prepare us. It's training and formation for this struggle. I can't remember which hymn it is that talks about, you know, by social forces swept along. Yeah. Um, you know, so it's the big... By social forces swept along. Yeah. yeah, so it's like the, it's the big gods, you know, that, that maybe are, are working um, within the whole community or within a whole nation or, or whatnot, um, a whole culture. But then I think there's also those little more individual um, spirits that can catch us. You know, I think about addiction mm. and the way that that can just transform a person or, or depression or anxiety, um, all these things um, that can be a part of telling us what we need to live and can be a part of telling us who we are. And I think that's another part of um, our baptismal liturgy that reminds us, you know, God has claimed you. And God has 
united you with Jesus to name you beloved. And so when those those spirits within us that want to whisper you're not enough or you'll never you'll never get clean, you'll never get sober, um, and you're really not worth worth it either. You know, that's where God's voice and God's spirit within us can tell us the other view of God's unending love for us and God's incredible valuing of us that says we are worthy and we deserve to be well and that God will bring us to a place of healing and wholeness. At this time, I invite you to set aside an offering for the congregation that you might continue to support the ministry of our saviors. We give thanks that our offerings are a sign of God's blessing, a remembrance of God's providence that God continues to care for us. Guided by Christ, made known to the nations, let us offer our prayers for the church, the world, and all people in need. For all who share the gospel and proclaim freedom in Christ, throughout the world, for the church and its ministries, let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For all God's works in creation, plants and animals, water and soil, forests and farms, and for those tasked with protecting our natural resources and all that exists, let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For government and leaders, cities and nations, rescue professionals and legal aid attorneys, elected officials and grassroots organizers, for all responsible for the well-being of civil society, let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For those who suffer in mind, body or spirit, those who are sick and hospitalized, those living with addiction, those struggling with mental illness, those who are hungry or homeless, and all in any need. Including those on our prayer list, Burl, Bob, Rosemary, Kate, Ing, Betty, Sharon, Dodo, Steve, Todd, Rick, Dwayne and Carol, Drayden, Janet, Craig, Kaysen, Doug, Alex, Jan, Dale, Beth, Carlotta, Bonnie, Jack, Evelyn, Michelle, David, and the friends and family of those who have recently died, including Kenneth, Pat, and Sandy. For caregivers, hospice workers, and health aides, let us pray. Have mercy, O oh God. For the concerns of this congregation, those who travel, those absent from worship, those celebrating birthdays or anniversaries, for the people of God in this place, 
and for other needs in our community, let us pray. O oh, mercy, have mercy, O oh God. For the covenant God made with us in the waters of baptism, in thanksgiving for the baptized who have died in the Lord, let us pray. Have mercy, O oh God. O oh God, receive these gifts as you receive us, like a mother receives her child, with arms open wide. Nourish us anew in your tender care, and empower us in faithful service to tend to others with the same love. Through Jesus Christ, our saving grace. Amen. the Creator, Jesus, the Beloved, Holy Spirit, the Comforter, strengthen you and give you peace.
Now go in peace, be the light of Christ. Thanks be to God.